Episode 10, double figures of the Sports Geek podcast. On today's episode, we'll chat to Russell Scabetti from thebusinessofsports.com about the growth of the sports CRM, take a look at Twitter takeovers, and also how to best handle feedback on your team or brand's Facebook page. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for the sports digital marketer. And now, here's your host who's reading your tweets right now, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek. Thanks again for downloading and listening. 10 episodes of the Sports Geek podcast. Thank you very much for the support so far. I've been absolutely blown away by the feedback and the stats. Just to give you a bit of an insight, we've had over 2,500 downloads from around the globe. Um, and as far as our top episodes go, uh, James Royo with episode one from the Tampa Bay Lightning still tops the charts. Follow close behind is episode five with Nick Trilson from the Bulldogs and Dan Pinney from the Storm. And episode four with uh, George Rose from the Manly Seagulls and Chris Seppenville from the Bobcats. Rounds out the top three, but uh, with over 39 countries downloading, um, really appreciate all the, all the feedback and the support. Uh, as you know from last week's episode, we're proud to have the Sea Conference on board as presenting partner of the Sports Geek podcast. So please check out uh, the killer lineup that uh, Christine and Chris have put together for the conference in Kansas City uh, for August 4 to 7. Uh, you can go to sportsgeekhq.com slash seat 2013. Uh, I look forward to seeing you there as well as, uh, as Christine and all my mates from the seat conference. One person you will see there um, is our guest that was on ABC Grandstand this week, uh, Russell Scabetti from thebusinessofsports.com came on to chat about the world of sports business, but especially his area of expertise, CRM. The initial discussion here on ABC Grandstand, Francis and I talk about uh, the Ashes and some of the current topics around the Ashes, one being a whether a player should walk or not walk, as far as Stuart Broad um, nicking the ball um, but deciding to stand his ground and not deciding to walk and let the umpire make the decision um, and also the uh, the fervour that the fans around Australia were watching the game when Ashton Agar um, started making runs as the number 11 and uh, kudos for Russell Scabetti for joining in the conversation without any knowledge of cricket whatsoever. Sean Callanan's with us now, our sports guru when it comes to the digital media, uh, still in moon boot and crutches. So I'd, quite... I'd love the option to walk or not walk, uh, Francis. <laughs> I'd love the option. At the moment, it's hobble or, uh, or fall over. So, yes. You should have walked. Is why, that's my stance anyway. Yes, well, um, we've had Australian batsmen who haven't done it in the past, so I guess uh, the wheel turns for all. Uh, interesting times uh, in the world of digital media. Uh, the fascinating thing was Friday night, and I spoke to somebody about this yesterday, was that in the past when uh, an event like the Ashton Agar thing happened, uh, we'd be able to presume or feel what was happening on the other side of the experience. So when Australia collapsed, we'd previously gone, oh, we can imagine how English fans are feeling and how delighted they are. But with Twitter and social media, you can read and interact and get a real sense of the uh, the level of energy and excitement and, you know, all the all the uh, sort of bitter, bitterness of uh, losing those wickets. It all converges at once, so it becomes very real. And when that turned around and Ashton Agar started to compile his innings and... Uh, Hashtag 11 started to trend across the country. It was this extraordinary coming together, a sort of collective and shared event, watching this young man become, uh, you know, a sporting icon in the space of three hours. Well, it definitely. I mean, it does create, it does make sport, you know, a great experience. Um, I have heard uh, people say that uh, um, Twitter has saved live TV, um, but for me, Live, live sport has actually saved and, and made Twitter what it is. And so that's what, you know, that whole Ashton Ago, the fact that he, you know, on debut has his own hashtag, if you will. Um, you know, the people were automatically, and, and it's not just Twitter. Um, I don't know if you've checked out the Sir Ashton Agar Facebook page. Um, it had 47,000 likes uh, by the next morning. So, you know, it's, the, you know, there was a bit of that shared experience. The people who weren't on Twitter were posting similar stuff. 
um, on Facebook. So, yeah, it does provide that shared experience when you're, you know, tuning into sport and, and it allows you to connect with pretty much anyone around the world. And particularly, as previously in the sort of pre-digital age, the shared experience was the crowd. You'd go to the games and you'd share it live or on television it was a sort of solitary experience. Uh, you don't have to be there necessarily anymore to have that experience. Well, that's true, and that's and that's the challenge for those who want to fill those stadiums um, to say, well, you know, the experience that you're having at home, um, one that you've got your high definition, or hopefully you have your high definition TV and and the coverage, and and then you've got your stats by your side, you've got your tablet running where you could be having chats with your friends, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or whatever, um, you know. The beer is cheaper, all of those kind of things. So that's the that's the compelling, you know, argument against um, going to the going to the game. Obviously, we can't all get on a plane and go to England, but you know, even for a local game, you know, the game might be down the road at the MCG. There are people that say, well, it's more comfortable and the experience is better. Um, you know, and that's the challenge for people who are trying to sell tickets and fill stadiums. Indeed. So the better we get at watching the games at home, the more uh, difficult it gets to sell uh, the games for the clubs and the organisations involved in putting it on. Yep, and it, and it does become the challenge to actually get more um, get more of the the facilities that that we expect and we, that we like to, to consume our sport with. Um, at the stadium, so we've you know we've talked about that before about being able to have the ability to to fire off a tweet or check the stats or uh, join in that conversation while you're at the game. You know, I'm not. You know, I actually agree with Mark Cuban. When I'm at a game, I'm invested in that game. I'm not a like I might. You know, I'll check in at the stadium. I'll take a shot and put it on Instagram and stuff. But I'm not going to have a backwards and forwards and ask people what they're thinking because I'll you know I'll use the old fashioned means of listen to the radio to to get the commentary on the extra part of the game. So, but there is that that fan that is growing up as a digital native that that's how they expect to consume their consume their content they're not a they're not a radio listener they're not listening to the broadcast they're listening to their their twitter feed or or their facebook feed so the increasingly quickly changing dynamic of what you call crm exactly and crm which is customer relationship management and um i believe uh, we have got a good friend of mine from the business of sports russell scabetti um, he runs the businesssports.com and knows a lot about the uh, the, the side of C- CRM and what teams are doing. Are you there, Russell? G'day, Russell. I'm here. How are you guys doing? Really well. We were just talking before. It was a cricket experience for us the, uh, the other night, but it was an organic one where the whole nation sort of stopped down and even though we couldn't be at Trent Bridge in Nottingham uh, to watch the game, had this uh, collective experience watching Australia and England play a test match in cricket. It's, uh, it just was a little snapshot of how being a fan and how to service those fans has changed so dramatically. Yeah, no, absolutely. There, there, there's, been a, there's been a huge shift uh, in the sports marketplace over the last few years. A big part of it is the incredible at-home experience you have, whether that's through the televisions or through social engagement with all these wonderful social media tools uh, or just so many general entertainment options and also the economy changing over the past few years. So on the team side, on the ticket sales side, it's definitely had an impact, and, and that's one of the reasons why teams have had to make significant investments into what what Sean mentioned, CRM, customer relationship management. Um, the more the more that teams can collect information about their fans and, and customize the the communications and the options available to them, the more they're going to be able to still bring them into the stadium to experience a live event and, and generate ticket revenue, as well as you know still provide that, that social experience for the people that still choose to stay at home. Um, I did read a. Um an article during the week which just solidified pretty much everything I've been thinking and CRM completely backs this up. Um, everyone loves talking about social and monetizing social, um, but email is still the way to go when you want to actually sell something. Um, everything that you're seeing in the CRM space and the sports and ticket sales space would absolutely back that up, wouldn't it, Russell? Absolutely. Um, social is wonderful, but I mean, the, the challenge to monetize social can actually drive a lot of people out of the conversation. Some people just want to interact with the team. They're not looking for the ticket messages or the merchandise messages. Granted, sometimes that will work, but uh, email is still the, the best way to generate direct revenue, both for, for single game sales or for small packages. And in particular, it's also a great tool for identifying leads for bigger ticket sales. So if your teams can integrate their email marketing into their CRM, it lets them, uh, and you send out a ticket email to your season tickets to your, uh, to your prospect, the people that are clicking on that email and visiting your pages 
they're self-selecting themselves as potential ticket buyers. And then you can, you, you know, put that information in front of your sales team. It's a, it's a great way for them to identify the best prospects for larger ticket purchases. How do you find that balance between remaining in a fan relationship with people who love your club or your franchise and them not feeling like they're just being hit on like a, a cold call door-to-door salesman who's coming to collect the cash? Um, a lot of that comes down to the training of the staff. I mean, our, our, our you know, all different teams, they're going to be calling on a wide range of fans, um, and the conversations, you know, some are going to be really obvious right away that they're not interested in ticket purchases. But if you have a well-trained staff, you can still have a great conversation because you're still talking to someone who's working for the team. They're inside. Oftentimes, they might have meetings with, you know, the team operations. So they have, like, a really great perspective on what the club is doing. So a well-trained staff can even enhance a relationship with a non-ticket buyer when they're on the phone. So it's all, it's all about making sure... All of your conversations and your communications with your fans are engaging and rewarding and listening to the fan. And then a trained staff member will also share store that information inside your CRM. So that way, if that name comes up again, you can see the information about those past conversations. And maybe you don't go into a hard ticket sale. Maybe you maybe you take that person off your call list this time and you just send them an email. The more you learn about what your fans like, the more you can decide when to communicate to them or how to communicate to them. Um. Russell, I was actually lucky enough, I've known Russell for a few years online, but I was lucky enough to catch him in person last year at, at SEAT and uh, at the SEAT conference this year in, in Kansas City. Um, you're running a, you want to tell us a little bit about your session? You've, you've sent me an email um, about uh, call, uh, sorry, Paul Greenberg. Do you want to tell me a little bit about Paul and, and what you're hoping to get out of the session? Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it, uh, to that session and to the whole conference. Uh, Paul is actually uh, casually known as the godfather of CRM. Um, he's been doing this for a wide range of industries and vendors over the past 20 years, and I've gotten to know him over the last couple of years just through LinkedIn and through emails, uh, and he was gracious enough to come out. Sports teams have really only jumped into the CRM space heavily over the last five, six years. So there's a lot that we can learn from non-sports organizations Things like uh, travel, hotels, uh, casinos, uh, you know, grocery stores. So he's going to be able to bring that experience he's had across multiple industries and, and give us a great opportunity to learn from those industries and also ask him questions about the evolution of CRM. Paul has really tapped into the transition from traditional CRM to social CRM, where you're having to get out of your database and into the different social channels and how you can get them to talk to each other. Uh, so I think it's going to be a great session. Russell, thanks for talking to us, and uh, you'll see Sean over there. Hopefully he'll uh, be uh, able to walk into the I'll be resting against a bar somewhere at the seat <laughs> conference with the moon boot on. You won't be hard to find me. He's on the DL at the moment. Good on you, Russell. All right, take care, guys. Thanks for having me. I'll see you in Kansas City, Sean. Cheers. Russell Scabetti there talking to us from uh, the business of sports.com. Like the Sports Geek Podcast? Find us on facebook.com slash sportsgeek. Thanks again to Russell Scabetti for joining us. You can check out his website, thebusinessofsports.com. Um, like I said in the interview, I've known Russell for a long time online. Um, definitely worth following his blog and his tweets, Ask Scabetti. Um, I'll have all the links in the show notes, sportsgeekhq.com slash 10. Definitely looking forward to his session at SEAT with Paul Greenberg. Uh, anyone who's termed the godfather of CRM is definitely worth checking out. Um, check out the full agenda for SEAT, sportsgeekhq slash SEAT2013. Um, this week, what I wanted to do was look at a few things that have been happening in the sports digital space. And one of those that seems to be getting a little bit more me- momentum uh, is Twitter takeovers. Um, and normally, just to give you, describe you the mechanic of, of Twitter takeovers, it's normally where a celebrity or, a, or an athlete will, will, will effectively take over a Twitter account and, and effectively provide answers and, and respond to fans directly on your, on your Twitter account. Um, for myself, I am not a big fan of them at all, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, for the first point uh, is that Twitter is transient by nature, so you don't read every single tweet um, people aren't always on board and watching tweets depending on what time you might you might do it. So the first thing is is that people might catch your Twitter stream uh, mid-2013 
Twitter takeover and not quite know why um, it's definitely presenting a different voice, which it will do if you've given over the reins to your account to someone completely different. So, um, you know, it is that the pop in nature and you miss the first five tweets that set up the Twitter takeover and then you're just confused. Um, and the other thing is about the voice. So, you know, you've spent a couple of years now developing a consistent voice um, and a consistent way for responding to tweets and responding to fans. Um, by doing a Twitter takeover, it's sort of, it, it, that can become quite, quite jarring. So, you know, you really should have a conversation plan. So there is a bit of guidance for the people who are running your Twitter account. Um, hopefully you do have, you know, one talented individual that is running the account. Um, but, you know, there might be a case where they might tear an Achilles or uh, leave and you want to provide a smooth transition from one person providing you the tweets to another. Or you might have multiple people running the Twitter account. So you must have a conversation plan of sorts. And we've transitioned a few few teams um, and a few staff members from over accounts that are running accounts for teams. And it's really important to have that conversation plan. And so you know, a Twitter takeover to a certain degree veers away from that plan because you're, you're using a completely different voice. Um, the other feedback that we've seen from fans um, from t- um, Twitter takeovers is that it clogs the timeline. Um, you might be very keen, it might be a half hour thing um, to, to do, but fans start complaining that there's too many tweets in their timeline from, from a particular account. Um, and that's something that you've got to be aware of whether you're doing a Twitter takeover or, or, or anything. You've got to be wary of how many tweets is enough um, because not every, uh, not every fan is going to be following hundreds and hundreds of accounts. They might only be following a, a small amount of accounts. And we've actually found that with some of the studies we've done with some of the teams. A lot of fans will stop after they've followed the team, followed all the athletes for a team um, and followed a few celebrities and that's it. So if, if one of those accounts starts over tweeting a little bit um you know there's a there's a chance that you'll upset them and you know you might get an unfollow um, my main beef with twitter takeovers is especially when there's a a quite capable uh athlete or celebrity that is on twitter um they really should be following the motto of twitter which is join the conversation and they should be ju- doing um this activity as themselves it definitely provides the you know authenticity um, you know, that's why Twitter has gone through creating verified accounts. You know, the fans know it's them because um, there is a little bit of lack of authenticity if, if you, especially if you're running a Twitter over takeover and you haven't provided, you know, photographic proof. You know, how are the fans to know that it is player X or celebrity doing the tweeting? I've seen a few accounts run a Twitter takeover and all they've done is said, hey, it's so-and-so running the account now and there really isn't any proof uh, for the fans to know that that is the case. So if you're going to run one, you want to make sure it's really obvious to the fans that they are talking to them. And if you are going to run one, you have to be very consistent with the tweets that are coming through. Um, I did see one uh, recently uh, where the AFL ran one with uh, Carmichael Hunt, part of Multicultural Round. And because Carmichael was tweeting, he pretty much said, sorry, guys, I've got to go. The missus says we have to go shopping. And some fans picked it up and saw it, um, thinking that, oh, the AFL have tweeted from the wrong account. Now, kudos to the guys at the AFL and um, Dion, who's former sports geeker. Um, he did go through and reply and explain to the fans, but it's just that little bit of point of confusion that sometimes can um, you know, reduce the effectiveness um, of, of that kind of campaign. Whereas had it been directly from um, Carmichael Hunt's account and potentially retweeted from the AFL account, it would have been a lot clearer that that's that's what was taking place and effectively that they'd brought in Carmichael to be tweeting and responding to fans. Um, so for mine, I, I definitely prefer the, the Twitter chat model um, where it sort of includes everybody um, and it's not just repl- you know, replying, which is a very much a one-to-one thing. You're not really getting the, the growth and, the, and the, um, the reach that you might want to do if you're doing lots of replies. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my take. But my main thing is, is that, that you lose the consistency of, of the voice that you've developed for your Twitter account. Um, and as soon as you t- hand over your account to someone else, um, if the fans can detect that, and it, it can potentially jar with what they're, they're reading and they're, you know, they can get a little bit confused. Um, and the thing is, you know, there's still a lot of people that are just still new to Twitter. Um, so, you know, it can be a bit confusing for those people. 
So that's my take. You know, I'm not a massive fan of of, of Twitter takeovers. I, I prefer the Twitter Twitter chat model in a similar way to the guys at SB Chat, uh, Lou and JW run on on Sundays or Mondays here in Australia, and the way that we've done it previously with a couple of our teams. Uh, the Auckland Blues do a really good job with Blues Chat. I know Dave Burton Shaw at the Adelaide Crows has a lot of fun with Crows Chat going backwards and forwards with the fans. Um, you know, I think that's a better one because it does get more fans engaged um, and, you know, pro- and it does provide the opportunity to bring in your, your celebrities, whether they be your athletes or, or your big celebrity fans. Sports Geek Podcast, available on Stitcher. SportsGeekHQ.com slash Stitcher. What I wanted to do is I had to um, answer a question that I had come in this week from a, from a client where they had a question on how to manage Facebook feedback. And the problem was that they, they had uh, comments in another language um, on their Facebook page and had a few people engaged in this discussion, so it became a thread. And the first thing was that they didn't know what the, what the comments were and they weren't quite sure how to handle it. So first of all, we'll look at, at the problem of multilingual feedback on your page. Um, there's a few options there and uh, on what you can and, and what you can do. Um, and then also just look at general feedback from a Facebook point of view and what you should be looking to do and what policies you should have in place to, to manage it. So the first thing was um, trying to figure out exactly what uh, these Facebook fans were saying. Uh, so what we used was Google Translate. Uh, so if you go to translate.google.com, you can grab a piece of text. Um, it even tries to detect uh, the, the language that you've done or that they, they have done, and it will try to convert it to English. Um, it doesn't always work. In this case, there was a lot of uh, the, what it appeared that they were using some kind of maybe Estonian language, but they were also using slang. So they had numbers replacing letters in some some cases. So because we didn't know what they were saying particularly, and we didn't really want to make we wanted to make sure that people who could read it weren't offended, um, we just went through um, and deleted the comment. Um, now deleting the comment doesn't actually delete it for the person that made it and their friends. So it's one way, it's one option, especially if you've got a comment of a, you know, a, a super passionate fan that's really upset, um, you know, after a loss or is having a go or is, you know, using a bit of strong language. Uh, most strong language is caught automatically by Facebook, um, but sometimes it is, it is missed. So you have the option to delete that comment. So it only hides it from your general fan page and your general fans. It won't hide it from their fr- those people who made the comment and their friends. So in the case of you know stronger trolls, sometimes deleting the comment will actually fire them up more. Uh, so this method is quite a good one in that it, they're not really notified that it's that it's no longer available to the general public, um, and it's it's not really uh, it doesn't put a red flag to them to say hey why do you keep deleting my comments. Um, the other options you have um, that have probably come before deleting them, and for mine, as long as it's not offensive um, or breaks any rules, then most of the time it's you pretty much should leave the comment because you're just going to get more bad feedback by um, trying to shut down people complaining, whether it be you know the silly comments that we all see. You know, if the team didn't spend so much time on Facebook and concentrate on training, we'd win more. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen those type of comments. There's nothing you can do with those passionate fans. You may as well just leave those comments there. It does help your edge rank overall. Um, yeah, so you do have the option to respond to the fans. You know, again, if it's a just an angry fan, um, it's not really worth um, responding to them. Um, but if they do have a genuine, uh, genuine concern or, or a question, you do now have the ability to reply um, in a thread, so you can reply directly to their comment, which is really useful. Uh, unfortunately, you can only do that um, on the desktop, not the mobile. Um, so responding to the fan makes sense. Um, if you do have a repeat offender that constantly is negative and is attacking other fans, um, it's always a good plan to, one, respond, tell them that, uh, you know, these are the rules that we've put down in our social media. Um, we'd like you to have followed them. Um, if they don't adhere to those kind of warnings, then from a last resort, you can... Um, block those fans um, from from your page. Um, so they're the main things that you've got in front of you from from a Facebook feedback point of view. Facebook is doing a relatively good job of catching a lot of the bad uh, from a from a swear words point of view, um, 
and automatically hiding them or marking them as spam, also marking people who are coming on as pages and sharing links are being marked as spam pretty, pretty, us- uh, pretty normally. Um, please check the legislation in your country. I know currently in Australia, um, it's, the onus is on the Facebook page owner, um, which is you know, very dangerous and very tough. Um, but if someone puts up something that is, that, uh, that is slanderous or against someone, unfortunately, that responsibility of that falls to the owner. So it's better to err on the side of deleting um, than getting yourself into a bit of a legal minefield. Um, that's it for this week. You'll be able to find the show notes for, for this show at uh, sportsgeekhq.com slash 10. Um, again, thank you to all the people who have um, given a review on on iTunes, both in Australia, um, and if you want to leave one in the US and UK stores, uh, please do. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, this week, sounds of the game come from the North Queensland Cowboys on Monday Night Football. Send them to me, uh, Sean at SportsGeekHQ.com. Or you can leave a voicemail, as Bob did during the week, asking about the Dwight Howard move. Um, I replied to Bob because I did talk about it on episode nine on Dwight Howard's uh, move. So that's it for this week. My name is Sean Callanan. You can find me on Twitter at Sean Callanan or at SportsGeek. Until next week, thank you very much for listening. on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.